Okay, everybody, thanks for coming out. It's my first time at LambdaConf and also my first time speaking on a technical subject in front of such a large and uh, esteemed audience, so I appreciate your patience with me. My name is Nathaniel Alcock. I'm a security software developer in Hudson, Ohio. I work for a company called Binary Defense Systems. We're a managed security service provider, and you can talk to me more about our products, but for my day job, I am uh, blessed to use F Sharp in the back end for a host intrusion detection system. And security is really fun. Today we're not going to be talking about security, but we're going to talk about web programming, which is how I got my start in programming. I, uh, just a quick note about me. I don't have a degree. I don't have any formal computer science education outside of a junior uh, year high school introduction to web design class. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but those, those of us who learn because of open source and self-teaching and stuff, uh, functional programming is a great community for that, and the goal of my talk is basically if you came to LambdaConf or if you're interested in functional programming, watching this in the future or whatever, 10,000 years on Pluto or however, uh, maybe you have like seen some things at the conference or read things that are really interesting to you and things like type theory and category theory and endofunctors, they come at you and you're like, all right, I'm, I'm sold, I want to do it, but how do I get started? And that's... Yeah, so it's cool, so how do I get started? And uh, for me, getting involved with programming, my first jobs were like making small businesses, crummy websites, and you build up from there. So I hope that uh, at the end of this talk, you can walk away with an idea of which, like how do I get started doing functional programming for the web? So beginnings are really important, and I took uh, inspiration from the ancient Greek, uh, the typed ancient Greek uh, talk earlier. So the beginning in every task is a chief thing. and I actually remember going, when I was still uh, trying to go to school, to a meetup group for computer nerds and people talking about Scheme and Lisp and Shen and all these advanced things and thinking like, these kids are really smart, there's no way I could ever do functional programming because I don't understand this, you know, I could barely get through algebra in high school, how am I supposed to do this? But I think uh, just getting started is uh, really key and hopefully after LambdaConf we'll have a lot more uh, new functional programmers. But things are spooky. Things are scary. What is a discriminated union? What is co-recursion? Monads. And uh, we had great talks about monads earlier, but I think for a lot of people, myself included, when we first came across homoiconicity, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it, let alone what it means, you know? So we've got to sort of break it down. So why should we do functional web programming, apart from it being cool or having an interest? Uh, in the World Wide Web, Things are kind of messy. We all know about LeftPad, yes? We all know about JavaScript and the problems that we have with that. Uh, code is crazy and mangled and people are making things which are terrible and it's really hard to deal with and functional programming gives us tools to write better code with less bugs that's easier to maintain. But what about jobs? <laughs> what are we going to do for like money, you know, instead of working uh, at a, a restaurant or whatever. So we got JavaScript, that's, that's a lot of jobs. And uh, oh, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, a lot of jobs. PHP, how many people love PHP in the room? I'm not seeing any hands. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that's, a big, that's another big problem, right? So I've gone on many job interviews, like I'm sure a lot of you have, and people are like, so how's your C Sharp? And it's like, I don't want to write C Sharp. I don't want to write Python. I don't want to write Ruby. I want to write things that are functional. And uh, if you're in a position like I used to be in where you're a web freelancer, it's a little bit easier because you don't have to convince anybody yourself that you're going to use a functional language. But when it comes to looking up resources about web programming specifically, these aren't just where the jobs are. This is where all the documentation is, all the examples is, all the talks are. So there have been a lot of actually great talks. There's going to be a great one after I'm done, this panel about front, front end. Mine is going to be a little bit less about that. There is the PureScript pre-conference and the type JavaScript uh, class, which was really interesting, and a lot of workshops about using some of these in a functional way. I'm not trying to deny the functional paradigm exists in other languages, but I wanted to kind of say, if you want to jump in to a uh, functional language, what, where, where should you get started? So we have this German word, which means being in thrownness. You know, you're thrown into this world like a dog without a bone. And the learning curve for functional languages is really crazy, right? You think, oh, this is awesome. Lisp is going to solve all our problems. I'll just write an AI to fix what I'm doing. And then, oh my god, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And then you kind of figure it out and you make a product that works. 
and you get comfortable with it. And I think doing something in JavaScript, you know, a lot of courses, people learn HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and they stick with that. And that's fine, but how are you going to challenge yourself to be a better developer? How are you going to challenge yourself to think more clearly? How are you going to challenge yourself to be a better engineer unless you take the plunge and summit the peak of inflated expectations? So how are we going to choose a functional language, though? How are we actually going to even get to the beginning? So some things are obvious. We want good documentation. And that's not just straight up docs. That's not just guides, but like books, examples, all the, the weird side things that aren't even a part of the language features that let you get into it without having to have a PhD in computer science. You might want the tooling. The tooling is key. We'll go over some examples in a minute, but bad tooling can kill it for me because I don't like hand mangling XML files. I don't know, does anybody like handwriting XML in here? I certainly don't. And then of course you want the libraries, the features, all that goodness for the web. So there's a lot of powerful languages out there, but I have never personally met anyone to write a web application in Agda. Probably because the Agda developers are not sitting around competing with Ruby developers or competing with Swift developers. So what matters to you? So do you care about easy package management? Do you care about integration with your editor? Are you an IDE person? Uh, all these things are things to consider when we're talking about getting started because, for example, we'll go over F Sharp in a minute, but if you work in a .NET business like I do where there's a lot of .NET code, F Sharp is going to win out even if it doesn't have the best project layout and it doesn't have the best pot package management because the interoperability with your existing .NET code is key and it's what what's able uh, for you as a developer to sell it to your boss, to say, hey, we don't have to completely overhaul the whole system, we can add functional to it. And as Soren Kierkegaard says, truth is subjectivity and subjectivity is truth. And that doesn't just mean moral relativism, that means wh whatever you pick, you commit to it and it makes it true. So I, for whatever reason, decided I liked Elixir, so I learned Elixir and I started making things in Elixir and now that's my sort of go-to but it might be different for you based on your conditions. So I don't want to just shill for things, but we all know the right answer is Haskell. The only answer is Haskell. Because Yisod, the Yisod web framework is great and you can build everything in it and Cabal is lovely to work with. And wait, no, there's Stack, you want to use Stack. And wait, Snap? I, there's all these, these things with Haskell and yeah, I, I built a bunch of web uh, websites and web applications for clients on DigitalOcean, and if you have the like low-level DigitalOcean uh, VM, you can't actually really use CSOD because GHC is too resource-intensive. But don't think about that because Haskell is the right answer. And this is an example of the beginning of a stack file for your project management. I chose to use project management to represent what it's kind of like in code, and you can see it just keeps going and. You know, wait, wait, maybe Haskell isn't the best. Not because it's bad, but because the web is weird. And maybe there are languages that have web frameworks like Haskell or OCaml or Prolog, but they're not exactly great. They're not exactly optimized for 2016, as uh, cliche as that is. So doing it well is really key. So if you go out and Google for functional web programming, you'll get a lot of really bad information from five years ago because it's just kind of a weird field. And uh, hopefully we can get through some of that weirdness. So the first language I want to talk about is Clojure. Clojure that solves a lot of the problems we talked about with Haskell. First of all, it's Lispy. So if you like the Lisp family of functional programming languages, maybe you went to the Shen talk earlier and you think that Lisp is cool, then you'll like Clojure. It runs on the JVM and the CLR. So if you work in a Java shop or more enterprisey type of place, you can sell it and it's easy to deploy. And there's Linegen, which is this great build tool. And here's the exact same, uh, basically the same as that big Haskell file, but that's the entire thing for the Linegen homepage. This describes all the dependencies, the versioning. It takes care of a ton of the project management for you. And that's really nice, as opposed to manually remembering what version of the markdown converter did I do last week when I was worried about my girlfriend or whatever, you know? You don't have to worry about that so much. And Clojure also has a really great ecosystem of uh, web frameworks built in, like Luminous, Pedestal, Hoplon, and then Ring. Ring is, I, I'm going to tend to focus in this talk on things like Ring, which are a little bit lighter, kind of like um, in F-sharp we have Nancy. I guess Ruby people have Sinatra, but I'm not a Ruby person. 
And basically, uh, a lot of my examples later on, I'll show you an, an entire web server that's built in Elixir that's basically three, line, like three little pieces of code. It's really easy with functional languages to do things that you would normally consider to be really hard. Uh, the next language I want to talk about is F Sharp. So if you like Haskell, if you like OCaml, and you like Microsoft, you'll really like F Sharp because not only does it leverage you know, CLR, it can do all these things with mono, but it has complete interoperability with both OCaml and C Sharp. So if you have some OCaml code, and you have some C-sharp code that you don't want to throw away, but you want to do it in a little bit more of a modern, updated language with a strong type system and a really great uh, type inference engine and all these extra kind of like more heavy functional features, F-sharp is a really great call. And luckily, the web frameworks of F-sharp are perfect. We only want to use this. Asp.net MVC, Suave and Nancy, Asp.net, everybody, give it a round of applause. It's great, you know? <laughs> And look at these, these project management tools. We have the fake build system, which is the F-sharp make. We have NuGet, which no one likes, so they use Packet. And then there's not really a build tool like Linengen, so we have Forge and Project and Project Scaffold, which is really fun. So when you want to start a new project, instead of saying, you know, line new, and it builds it for you, you can copy the sort of folder structure from a GitHub repo, and then you can use this XML file that's generated by Visual Studio called FSProj, and oh wait, this is another trade-off, right? So if you, if you like the .NET and you like the ML and you like the interoperability, you might have to have, pay a price in the web frameworks and the tooling not being what you want, or at least not being what I want. And remember, I said it's subjective. And when we're thinking about it, I don't want to like oversell it, but the trade-offs is a real thing because every day you have to deal with the build system and the tooling and the environment and all those things. And once you have a web app or once you have a project that's been using F Sharp for six months, fixing this is not really on the table. You kind of just have to live with that. And here's what an FS proj file looks like. It's designed to, and this is like one tenth to one twentieth of an actual FS proj file. Like this is the very beginning. Um, this is designed to be created automatically for you by Visual Studio. So if you use Visual Studio, then you don't care about this. But if you don't, like you're like me and you don't do that, this is going to become something you have to deal with all the time. So what about Elixir? Elixir is my favorite. I'm a fanboy. I'm terrible, I know. Elixir has this interesting history. So there was these smart French people who made Prolog, and then people who wanted to make you know, highly resilient network applications. They made it like Erlang and then people who want to make functional web stuff, and so they made Elixir. It offers really cool things like concurrency, so you don't have to worry about all the threads, and things just work. And there's a lot of really mature um, frameworks and libraries for it, like Phoenix, which is sort of like Ruby on Rails, Sugar, which is a lighter one, Plug, which is similar to Ring that I mentioned earlier, and of course the open teleco, uh, telecom protocol, protocol, excuse me, which is all the Erlang goodness for networking, that you can just bring into you with Elixir. So just like with uh, F Sharp, you can have full interop with OCaml and C Sharp. With Elixir, you basically get Erlang for free as part of it. And the documentation in the community are really excellent. Elixirlang.org, ElixirNation.io, there's tons of sites, there's tons of examples. You, like I learned Elixir without buying a single book, without reading a single book, because there's so much online free documentation that you can get started with a project and not even have to worry about um, missing, I mean, just looking at the function descriptions on the Elixir Lang docs is enough to get you started running off, uh, off to the races. And the mix tool is like a dream come true. True, It builds the project for you, you get automatic tests, you get uh, the dependency management, and um, I guess uh, at this stage, I'm just gonna show you a very simple uh, full stack or like the back end for a, a web app that I made for a client way back in the day when I was just getting started as like my first Elixir project. So the first thing is the mix.exs file, which is your project file. And it defines, as you can see at the top, uh, what is it? The project name is called simple, the mix file. And you define it. Versioning is usually done automatically for you. So almost all of this is auto-generated. The only things that I really had to do was tell it Okay, what applications am I going to use and what versions do I want? Then whenever I run mix, 
to install or update. It'll automatically handle all the dependencies for me. It's all declared. I don't have to worry about interactively doing anything. And when I go to deploy it, I always know what versions I need, and it will never be messed up or screwed up, and it'll always be perfect and you know, just like we want. And that's the whole file, by the way. All these Elixir files are going to be the whole file. There's no, like, that's it. That's all. And they're all going to get smaller, if you'll notice. So then we have the supervision. So this is the actual simple web app um, file itself that defines the application. Now I added, this is like extra. There's like supervision for this, which you don't necessarily need. But I put it in there because why not? Um, again, this is pretty self-explanatory, I think. You know, there's a supervisor and manages workers and blah, blah, blah. So you can cleanly put up and put things down, put them to bed. And then we'll actually get to a simple, the routing. So up here we've got these uh, plug libraries, which basically bring all the routing you need to do. So I threw in, hey, if I'm in a development environment, give me the nice console debugger instead of, if, in case I screw something up. Uh, I want to be able to match and dispatch things. If someone requests the root, send them uh, the index file <laughs> and a 200, and otherwise send it to the next module, static. And this is what does 90% of the work right here. This is the whole file for static. It just serves whatever is matched in the, the file, or in the folder. And if it can't find it in that directory, it serves at the 404. And I, yes, this is very rudimentary, but this was good enough for a client of mine who was like a, a wood shop or whatever. And uh, I put this up, and then of course later I fixed it and made it nicer. But just to, to go back, this is the entire thing. This is everything I ever had to touch. You could have added tests, you could have added all the assets and everything else. But Mix builds everything you need to actually make a executable or run it in production for you. And that is a lot of power, in my opinion. So what are we doing with Lambda Comp 2016? So maybe you came here and you've got a project that you've been thinking about. You've been thinking about, what do I need to do? What, 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 um, to put it another way, there's a, a project you want to do you got to think about what is actually required and which of these things make sense. So if you need like, uh, if you need it to be in Java world, go do Clojure. If you need .NET, you're going to go to F Sharp. If you want to be one of the cool hipsters, you're going to go to Elixir. And uh, that's totally legitimate. And th the thing is, is like with the supervision, even though that was really simple in my example, I would have never thought to do this if I hadn't been messing with Elixir. I would have never thought about that. I would have never thought about what if I want to run this stupid web server on a hundred different DigitalOcean droplets instead of one, you know? I would have never thought about, um, I would have never thought that I could write something that was so short. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you try it and it breaks and you try it and it breaks and you try again. And the real benefit to functional programming is that your like, peers, the people around you in this room are all usually pretty good people, even if they're arrogant and superior, or just more intelligent than you, you know? The people in this room are usually actually like really helpful, and you can email, like the, El like the Elm devs, you can email them, you can email the PureScript devs. It's a, a very nice world indeed. So I want to thank you, and uh, hopefully if you came to this talk one day, you'll end up being a, a Lisp wizard, as we all uh, aim to be. And if there's any questions, I would be happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much.